Heavenly Father, thank you for yet another new day of life, and I pray that you will be with us as we sing. I pray for your spirit, and I pray also for the speaker, and I pray that you will open our hearts and our ears to what you have for us today, and I pray this all in your name, amen. The first song we will be singing is Revelation 21. to be singing is Second Corinthians four.
next Wednesday, you won't meet here. I know I didn't have to tell you that, but just want to make sure you're clear. Next Wednesday schedule, what time do you get up? At 5, that's right. Everything's 45 minutes earlier. And class begins when? At 7, that's right. 7 to 10. Make sure you're packed before then. The van should leave for the airport about 20 after 10. How many of you are going to the airport? If you'll hold your hands up high. Okay, five guys. How many girls? Up high. Okay. Two. Um, how many of you are staying for break? I need to see hands. One, two. No, no, you're not. Okay, so I see. Uh, how many, okay, hold your hands up higher if I, if you would. One, two, three girls and two guys. Okay, five. All right, very good. The sign-up sheet for the airport will be um, on the bulletin board in the CAF a little early, later today. And... Um, Sometime in the next few days, we'll have a schedule posted for those of you who are staying. Uh, the college students will be here uh, during break. They return this Friday afternoon, actually. The Lord has really blessed their experience and mission, and we're very thankful for his blessing. I have uh, my husband bought for students a book written by a friend of his, of ours, who um, has a ministry in Mexico. And if I could have some guys help pass these out, uh, I think you'll find it interesting reading uh, in your spare time, not during assembly. Um, Sunday... We have our International Food Fair, and uh, we're still um, working out some details on who will be in which areas. We're going to have some Filipino food. We're going to have some uh, Thai food. We're going to have some Bolivian food and other uh, South American food. I think it's going to be very nice, and you're going to enjoy working on um, preparing it. And I just want to talk a little bit about the food fair. You're going to spend the first, um, okay, Sunday is a school day schedule. Yeah. So um, you're going to spend the first about 30 minutes doing some research on your area. And we want you to be able, as a group, uh, there'll be four to a um, home that is focusing on that area. Uh, we want you, as a group, to be able to share information about the culture, uh, about the land, about the language, about the food, about the Adventist church work in that area. So you're going to have about half an hour. As you see the names um, that will fill up those slots later today, I want to encourage you to spend some time sitting together and talking about what different aspects you are going to present. Um, Actually, it won't be just the four of you. It would be like 12 of you because there's three to a um, culture. So, so that you don't have a lot of repetition, uh, but you all have the opportunity to share something on Sunday about that, that country and the people. 
Um, and then you will go to the, to the homes of those who you're going to be working with. Um, and if they're in town, then they'll be arranging transportation. So lunch will be around 12.15, 12.30, I would guess 12.30. And um, then you'll, you'll clean up and you'll be in your vocational areas between two and four. Now, if you have something that is cultural that would look nice on the table as a decoration, uh, bring that too. And tell the, tell the staff member that you're going, whom you are going to be working with um, what you have. Because it's nice to have a little bit of a uh, cultural flavor in terms of the, the um, environment of the table. If you have a um, article of clothing that goes with that, it's a good time to wear it too. So we'll have a good time. Uh, this will be the first time we'll actually have college students also here with us, so I'm glad for that. Um, and I think, I think it'll, I know it'll be delicious. Um, there, there will be little uh, cards for you to get stamped or, or hole punched, um, showing you've been to that table and um, you've received your food. So you can go to the three different areas. There will be more than that tables. Okay, any questions? Yes? You sign up. And um, it'll probably be up tomorrow morning. There's still a, a little bit of movement as far as which staff are going to be doing which. So, okay, other questions? All right, let's kneel as we pray. Father, this morning we are reminded of how you love the people of this world and how you are working diligently for their and our salvation. And Father, I uh, want to thank you for the work you're doing in South Texas. I pray that there will be many souls in the kingdom because of the work of the college students and that you will continue to protect them and use them and encourage them and Give them today many divine appointments. And I thank you for that um, answer to our prayers. We also pray that you will bless us as we have assembly, that you'll bless Miss Laura as she speaks to us, that you will help us to put everything else out of our minds and to be learners. And I thank you too for the abundance of good things that you are giving to us. And Lord, that break is very soon. Please bless us and guide us and use us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I am turned it on. Um, so just bow your heads with me as I just have a short prayer for myself. Father in heaven, I pray that the words that I would say would be yours, that you would teach us something here today, and that your Holy Spirit would be the one that is guiding everything. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start with actually showing you a video of a BBC broadcast in 1957. And I think that as you see this, it will hopefully be a memorable illustration of what we're going to be talking about in a little bit. But this is a, a broadcast, actually broadcast is in 1957. It isn't only in Britain that spring this year has taken everyone by surprise. Here, in the Ticino, on the borders of Switzerland and Italy, the slopes overlooking Lake Lugano have already burst into flower. 
at least a fortnight earlier than usual. But what, you may ask, has the early and welcome arrival of bees and blossom to do with food? Well, it's simply that the past winter, one of the mildest in living memory, has had its effect in other ways as well. Most important of all, it's resulted in an exceptionally heavy spaghetti crop. The last two weeks of March are an anxious time for the spaghetti farmer. There's always the chance of a late frost, which, while not entirely ruining the crop, generally impairs the flavour and makes it difficult for him to obtain top prices in world markets. But now these dangers are over and the spaghetti harvest goes forward. Spaghetti cultivation here in Switzerland is not, of course, carried out on anything like the tremendous scale of the Italian industry. Many of you, I'm sure, will have seen pictures of the vast spaghetti plantations in the Po Valley. For the Swiss, however, it tends to be more of a family affair. Another reason why this may be a bumper year lies in the virtual disappearance of the spaghetti weevil, the tiny creature whose depredations have caused much concern in the past. After picking, the spaghetti is laid out to dry in the warm alpine sun. Many people are often puzzled by the fact that spaghetti is produced at such uniform length. But this is the result of many years of patient endeavour by plant breeders who've succeeded in producing the perfect spaghetti. And now the harvest is marked by a traditional meal. Toasts to the new crop are drunk in these boccalinos. And then the waiters enter bearing the ceremonial dish. And it is, of course, spaghetti picked earlier in the day, dried in the sun, and so brought fresh from garden to table at the very peak of condition. For those who love this dish, there's nothing like real homegrown spaghetti. All right. Let me bring my PowerPoint up here in just a minute. What do you think of that video? Hmm, I hear some controversy with that. Well, what's the controversy? It doesn't grow on trees, but it sure looked like it did there. You can argue with the BBC? Is BBC pretty, pretty kind of world renowned? Yeah? <laughs> this was an actual broadcast that was on the BBC. It was broadcasted in 1957, but it was broadcast on April Fool's Day. But after the broadcast, the BBC had multiple calls that came in about people who wanted to know where they could get their own spaghetti tree um, and information about more about these trees. Now, at that time in 1957, there wasn't they, they weren't eating a lot of spaghetti at that time, so spaghetti was a very well, you know, kind of new kind of thing for the British people, and so they didn't know a lot about it anyway. You probably know a lot more about spaghetti than the British people did in 1957. But I think this illustrates a very important fact. Why do you think this hoax, as it were, was so effective? Hmm? Okay, it was visual. It looked, you know, the photography of its day now. Back then, you know, I mean, compared to what we do in news broadcasts now, maybe it was just black and white. But back into the day, it had a news broadcaster, it had the photography, you had visual evidence. Why else do you think it was effective? It had BBC behind it. I mean, who's not to trust BBC? I watch, you know, things that are, you know, broadcast by BBC. I'm not expecting them to tell me a lie, right? And so this leads to the fact that most of the important things a person believes, he believes it because someone in authority or someone he trusts told him so. You think about, you know, what you learn in school about, you know, science or um, even the principles of math sometimes or history. Did you go and see Alexander the Great back in the day and see what he did? No. You trust somebody who wrote down what he, what he experienced and you trust what they said. Or maybe somebody tells you about what the physical law is in, in physics or something. You haven't maybe done all the testing on it, but you trust that somebody who, who figured out the law, they knew what they were talking about and you trust them, right? So a lot of things that we believe and a lot of the important things we believe 
We believe because we trust somebody who told it to us. But the problem with that is one's knowledge is only as good as the person you trust. Because if who you trust is telling you a lie, well, your knowledge isn't very good. So we have a, a question in our world to figure out who's telling the truth. Because there are people who are going to tell us the truth, and there are people who are going to tell us lies, whether they're intentional or non-intentional. They may not be good, trustworthy sources to gain our information from. And so we have these questions of, like, who do I trust? You know, who's telling me the truth? Or, you know, what is really real? And how do I know what truth really is? And so today, we're going to try to attempt to at least cover a couple of these questions. Um, we probably won't get through all of them. But number one, how the aspects of one's worldview work together to define what truth looks like in all aspects of life. Number two, worldviews may be descriptive of a person's beliefs, but are not descriptive of alternative realities that are out there. And number three, what a biblical worldview is, especially in light of the great controversy, and how can knowing what a biblical worldview help me to know what is truth when I see it out in the world or how to determine who's telling me the truth and who's not? So let's start with how does a worldview define what truth is to you? Now, the worldview is just basically a comprehensive view of what reality is to a person. Um, this is one definition that I found. A worldview is a system of fundamental beliefs assumptions, values, ideas about the universe and our place in it that shapes how a person understands their life, their experiences, and the lives and experiences of others, and how that person acts in response. And so we, we see that this kind of um, worldview, it's something that affects everything that we do in our life, whether we know it or not, it, it, it encompasses everything. And how we think affects what we think about other things and what we see as truth or not truth. And every worldview attempts to answer a set of core questions. These are the questions that every worldview has an answer to in some way, form, or another. And these kinds of questions, often they aren't regularly discussed. Um, we don't spend a lot of time sometimes reflecting on them, but everyone definitely operates our actions and our thoughts based on answers to these questions, whether we may take time to think about it or not. There was a parable once told that there was like two fish swimming in the, the ocean somewhere. There were two young fish, and they were swimming along, and they met another older fish coming the other direction, and he's like, good morning, guys. You know, how's the water? And they just kind of kept swimming, and he kept swimming, and finally the, the two boys were like, what in the world is water? For them, they, they're swimming in it, but they had never really thought, what, what, what is water? Now, that's just a parable, but it really speaks to the truth that sometimes we're swimming, as it were, in worldviews that are around us, and we've actually never taken the time of what is the worldview that I'm swimming in? What is it, and what are the different, there might be more than one that I'm swimming in, but have I really taken the time to think, what is it? That makes it. So we're just going to take a little brief look at like what these kinds of questions are that a worldview answers. So number one, is there a God? You might say, well, atheism is a worldview and it doesn't believe in God. Well, it's not to say that it doesn't have something to say about God. It does. It says there's no God. But it definitely has something to say about it. So these are kinds of questions that would be answered. You know, is there a God, first of all? Is it the God of the Bible? Is it human um, deities? Is it just the universe itself? And if there is a God, what is it like? Is it personal? Is it impersonal? Is it perfect? Um, does it, you know, how does it relate to the world? Does it relate at all? Or is it a part of the world? Is it identical to the world, like pantheism? You know, how does God relate to human beings? How does God relate to me? These kinds of questions, the answers to these questions, affect how you're going to understand God in the world around you. What we can know and how we can know it. Can you know anything at all? How do you know that you're even here? Um, how do we know what we know? What's the ultimate source of knowledge? Do we get it from um, divine revelation, from God? God tells us what's the, the ultimate reality. 
Or is it our reason that we have to reason and that will tell us what the ultimate reality is? Or is it just our feelings? Or is it science? Or is it what we can experience? Is it mystical experiences? Um, Are there limits to the knowledge that we have? What can we know about the universe or God or ourselves? Those are the kinds of questions that a worldview will answer. What is a human? This one has become more significant in recent years to me on why this is so significant. It talks about where did we come from? Did we evolve? Were we created by God? Um, What kind of beings are we? Are we just a lump of cells that have no meaning? Or are we created in God's image? Are we purely physical? Do we have spiritual elements? Are we unique? Are we basically good? Or are we kind of basically bad or somewhere in between? Do we have free will? Do we not have free will? And then what's life's purpose? Do we have purpose at all? Do we exist for any particular reason? Um, Is it to, to live for pleasure? Is that the purpose of life? Is it to prepare people for life in a community with a loving and holy God? What's the purpose and meaning to life and history upon earth? Um, What determines right or wrong? Uh, what's What's the highest ultimate good that one could do? Is morality something that there is a real sense of morality, this is right, this is wrong, or is that just kind of all an illusion that we have made for ourselves? Um, is it situational, that what we do is right or wrong? Is that based on our situation, our culture, the time we live in? Or is it all the time, in every culture, every place, every people, is there a right and a wrong that's the same for everybody? Um, why should we be good anyway? How are we to know what's good or right? What's the standard? Are we held accountable for this right and wrong? And then last, what happens after death? Is death just the end? Do you get reincarnated? You know, what, what happens? So with those understanding, that's what, you know, those are the questions that all worldviews answer. There is lots of worldviews. Um, you think of the isms, any kind of thing that has an ism in the end is kind of like, in a sense, uh, a kind of a worldview of how they're understanding the universe and life and how they're relating to it. There's humanism, naturalism, atheism, postmodernism, new age, pantheism, all kinds of different things. Then you have like uh, Christian theism, Islamic theism, Judaism theism, there's all kinds of different things. So you might wonder, well, there's so many worldviews, does it really matter? We live in a, a day and age when it's very um, politically correct to say, well, what's good for you is good for you. What's good for me is good for me. We can all be right together. And that's what a very common thing is to think of today. But it leads back to this question or this statement. Just because there are many worldviews does not mean that there are many realities. And that's what people often confuse when they're saying, oh, what's good for you, what's good for me, is that somehow there's these alternative realities that kind of, you know, you pick and choose which one, you know, fits you. But there is some problems with that. And these are two reasons why everyone can't be right. Number one, often in these worldviews, there is very different worldviews that contradict each other at a very basic, important level. It's not possible that both of them could be right at the same time. For example, obviously atheism has at its very core foundation to almost everything else in those list of those six things that make up the worldview, the idea that God does not exist. Then you have another worldview, theism, and any kind of other theism that's around it believes that God does exist, and everything that are answering those questions are going to be based on that belief. So you Could you have both of those things happening at the same time? There is no God and there is God? No, of course not. So you can't have both of them happening at the same time. That would be an impossibility logistically, logically. You can't have two in reality happening at the same time. And even beyond that, there may even be some similar worldviews that we would say, well, they're kind of similar, maybe like uh, Islamic theism and Christian theism. They both believe in a God, but yet the picture that they paint of reality is quite different from each other. Like if you, you look into the Islamic reality and the Christian reality of who God is, one is a very personal and loving God, and one is a very impersonal God. They both believe in God, 
but the way that they describe their whole understanding of reality is so different that you couldn't have them the same. And so that means that it's not just alternative realities you pick. There is actual realities that you can't have them all at the same time. So one has to ask the question, is a worldview consistent with reality? And I believe that God, he wants us to come and reason together, he says. He wants us to use our brain to evaluate things. And I'm, I'm going to show a few examples, not to like simplify worldviews, because there's a lot of complexities that go with worldviews. But I want to just kind of give you an example how you can see that even you, with the power of the Holy Spirit working with you and using common reasoning, you can tell that not all realities could be possible. So we're going to just look at three tests here. Um, number one is the test of logical consistency, which means, is this worldview consistent with itself? Um, number two, is it historically consistent with itself? And number three, experiential consistency. Is this worldview consistent with what I experience in this world and I see it? So just to give you an example, um, naturalism is the idea that matter and energy are all that there is. There's nothing outside of just pure nature. Everything in life has to be explained in the terms of the properties of matter and energy alone, and that's it. Um, atheism would fall under this because it's kind of excluding God, it's just nature working, there's no supernatural. Now, is this world, we'll, we'll use test number three for this. Um, test, th test number three, experimental consistency. Um, is this world, is this worldview, naturalism, what it just said, consistent with what life is like? Okay, let's think about that. In this life, do you experience things like meaningful relationships, unselfish love, self-sacrifice, justice, and hate? Do you see that in the world that you live in? Yes? No? Do you see at least one of those things? Yes. Naturalism has no explanation for any of those things. Naturalism says that if you're just evolving, you know, a group of cells, why does a lump of cells, why would they ever do self-sacrifice? That would be against the survival of the fittest. Even, even hate, which is, you know, on negative side, why would a lump of cells decide to hate another lump of cells? That doesn't even make sense, right? So these qualities of things that are meaningful to us, if we see them and experience in our life that we live, we see unselfish love in people's actions towards us, or we see self-sacrifice, this does not match the exper experimental consistency because the worldview says that those things, well, they don't have an answer for it. Because they're just lumps of cells. How's a lump of cells going to be hate or unselfish love? All those things. So it doesn't match. It fails that test of experiential consistency. Uh, Postmodernism, it's very prevalent in today. It's probably the most uh, pervasive worldview in our culture today. It's where you hear people might say, that's true for you, but not for me. Or you have your truth, I have my truth, that kind of thing. And the essence of postmodernism itself is the idea that everybody decides for himself what is true and what is right. It's based purely on individual choice. Now, we're going to check that with test number one, log logical consistency. I want you to think about this. Everyone chooses what's right. Nobody knows what's right. So I kind of put this together into one statement. See what you think of it. There is no truth that applies to everybody, but the truth that there is no truth that applies to everybody. Okay, so let's read this again. There is no truth that applies to everybody. That's kind of what postmodernism says. You know, there's no truth that's true for you, 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 and everybody. You know, if you want to have a different view and you different view, it's all up to you. There's no truth that applies to everybody. But the truth that no truth applies to everybody. Do you see a logical consistency problem here? If you're saying there's no truth, but then you're saying there's something that's true about everybody, isn't that saying something's true about everybody? That's not logically consistent. Okay, so even that one, it fails logic logically, it doesn't hold together with itself. Now, um, even with Islam, 
and this would be like a test of historical consistency, um, Islam holds that when you actually read the tenets of Islam, it holds that the Bible, um, the first, uh, like the Torah, the Psalms, and the Injil, which is the New Testament, they are actually holy books. They, they, they say they are in the Quran, that they are good, but then if you've ever heard about Muslims or met a Muslim, you know that they don't read the Bible. They say that later it was corrupted of some kind. But we have a problem historically with this statement because the Quran, it, Quran, it was written in the seventh century. Um, in the Quran, it speaks that the Bible is reliable and it's good. Okay, so according to their book, it's reliable and good in the seventh century. But we have New Testament manuscripts that date back to the second century. And we have Old Testament manuscripts from the first and third century that are almost word for word of the Bible that we have today. Do you see a historical problem with that? They're saying that somehow it was corrupted. But when was it corrupted? Because we have manuscripts before the Quran was written. That's the ones we use kind of today for our translations. And yet their own Bible says in the seventh century that it was fine. So when did it get corrupted? So this is a historical inaccuracy that doesn't fit within itself. Um, and just, you know, to look in Adventism, if you look at the logical consistency of the, and we're going to get a little bit more in depth in the great controversy scheme and whatnot, but it's historically consistent, it's logically consistent, and experientially. We see suffering, we see sin, we see love, we see unselfishness, and it is the conflict of good and evil in the world, and we see it in the life that we live. It passes the test. So why does these worldviews matter? Okay, we want to talk a little bit about what a biblical worldview is, because we've talked about a lot of these other ones, and how it answers these particular ones, uh, these questions that a worldview answers. Um, we know that in 1 John 1.14, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And John 17.17 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And so we know that the Bible is trying to tell us what truth is and where we can find it in Jesus. And when we look at these questions that a worldview answers, we do have answers for them. Our, the Bible helps us to understand um, what reality is, where we get our true knowledge from. We believe as Christians that we get divine knowledge, but God wants us to use our reason. He wants to, to use our experience to gain knowledge, but there are certain limitations to that reasoning and knowledge. And that those things that we cannot understand that way, God has given us knowledge. Like, you know, we have not been, we were not here when the earth was created, but God can give us that knowledge of where we come from, um, that we weren't there to experience. There are things in nature that we can learn about God, but there is things about nature that it cannot reveal about a loving, personal Savior that God has to reveal to himself in himself when he came and also in his word. Um, the Bible helps us to know who we are as a human being which is really important in this, this day and age when I think the question of what a human is is even a bigger question than ever was before. We have people who are, you know, thinking they're trans species, you know, cats and dogs and, you know, trans, you know, like they, they're all kinds of things into things that are not even necessarily human anymore. We are in a state where we don't even know what it means to be human. And this is the time when God wants us to come and say, I want you to know that what it means to be human. I have the answer. I want to help you. And so as a Christian, we can have that understanding. And what our true purpose is um, and where our final destination is, what determines our right and wrong. So we're going to take a look at some of these things, but we're running out of time, so I can't, I can't do it too much. Um, uh, the basic worldview, biblical framework that even non um, Adventists would agree upon, most evangelical Christians would agree with these four kind of uh, framework for a biblical worldview, and that is creation, that God created a perfect world, nothing wrong with it. Number two, sin entered and marred a perfect world, so what we see now is not perfect anymore, it does reflect a broken world. Jesus came to redeem us, to bring a reconciliation from this broken planet so that we could be restored, and restoration. And that's just kind of a broad view. 
Now, as Adventists, we have even more truth than even the world uh, that the Christian world has. And so I've kind of broken this down into like seven steps of how we understand the world that we live in, the universe, and all those questions that we mentioned earlier. Number one, God did create a perfect creation. He created a perfect universe, intelligent life. It was perfect. But then sin entered in heaven before it even entered here on earth. And so we have a war that begins to take place. Lucifer makes allegations against God's character, his law. And then humanity is brought into the conflict. And Adam and Eve fall. And sin mars the earth and the things that we see here. But then Jesus comes, his death on the cross grants humanity the possibility for restoration. And his life shows us how. His life and resurrection show us how. Not just that he's going to give it to us, but how he can restore us back into the image of God. We understand um, that the investigative judgment, the lives of everyone who has claimed to be on God's side, who is choosing sides in this war, will be investigated by the people who haven't fallen, and they're going to decide, are these people safe to have them living up in heaven with us again? Because this is a war, and you don't want traitors in your midst. And so they want to make sure, is it, is it really safe to have them back to be reunited once more? Then we have the final test of loyalty. Eventually, there will become an end point to this war, and everyone's going to have to pick their side, and it will climax with Jesus' second coming. And then, seven, the restoration is complete. God's fully vindicated of all Satan's charges. Even Satan himself will say, you are just in everything that you have done. Um, the wicked will be judged. They will understand why they are there. And those who choose to follow God's way, they are restored to an existence free from the effects of sin. This is the biblical worldview as Adventists we hold. But this is under attack. Now, there is a... Uh, Barna study group did a study, and they said that during the pandemic, the number of Christians that hold a biblical worldview dropped from 6% to 4%. Now, 6% is not a good number, but neither is 4%. And I looked to see, you know, what constituted having a world biblical worldview. These were the things that if people agreed to these statements, they got, and they agreed to all seven of them, that's what put them into that 4% category. Do you disagree with any of those? God's the creator of all things. Human beings are naturally sinful. Knowing Jesus Christ is the means to salvation. The entire Bible is true. Absolute moral truth does exist. There is ultimate purpose for human life, and it's to know, love, and serve God. And success on earth is best understood as a consistent obedience to God in thoughts, words, and actions. Now, there's other things that other, other people in um, other denominations might believe that they hold a lot of similar beliefs and we might have some differences, but I'm not sure any of those would be the differences. But there is a vast majority of Christians that do not believe in all of these. And I want to kind of close here with a couple different um, statistics. In that 4%, they kind of split it down between age groups to see who is believing the, that biblical worldview, those seven kind of things that we just looked at. And they found that 1% of that was adults under 30. The smallest group, as you can see, the ages as they're getting younger and younger, what are they not believing anymore? The biblical worldview. So what I wanted to leave with you is how do we know who to trust? You guys are in school right now. And you're going to go to college. You're going to go elsewhere. You're going to listen to pastors. You're going to listen to friends. You're going to listen to people. So how can you know who's telling you the truth? Number one, you need to know what you believe. Because how can you evaluate anyone else if you don't even know what you believe? Be intentional about actually developing a biblical world for you yourself and knowing what those answers are to those questions. Remember those six questions that every worldview answers? What does your biblical view have to say about those questions? And then, you know, how can that give meaning to me, a sense of direction to where I'm going in my life, a calling, not just in my church life or when I go to church, but in every aspect, my school, my workplace, in every aspect of life. So that's number one. Know what you believe, because you can't, 
You can't try to evaluate somebody else if they're telling you the truth if you don't know what you think is truth. And then number two, find out what they believe. Because sometimes we don't always understand where somebody is coming from. They can be looking at the exact same thing that I do, but see it from a different perspective because they have a different worldview. They're having different assumptions that they're coming through. And so as Christians, we should ask about everyone certain things that if this person is like an authority figure that we're going to now take from them some kind of truth, you know, whether it's a teacher or a pastor or somebody that we're going to accept knowledge from, we need to ask some things about them. Number one, what is their worldview and beliefs? And is it consistent with a biblical world, great controversy worldview? What are they saying? And is it in harmony with the Bible principles that we know? And what determines their moral standards or beliefs? Is it cultural? Is it feeling? Is it personal opinion? Or is it the Bible? Do they have some, what are they determining their right and wrong from? And that will give you clues on where they're coming from in their worldview. And if it's from a worldview that is not a biblical worldview, it's not wrong to necessarily listen to them. They may have some things that would be of value to you. But you need to listen with the idea that not everything, the conclusions that they may come to, may be conclusions that I would come to if I was coming from a biblical worldview. And you need to keep that in mind when you're listening to what they say. Um, Christians, we can be... Um, not even just the beliefs. Sometimes we can be affected by, you know, uh, practice. We can ask, you know, who, who originated or promoted a particular practice or technique that is being promoted. Sometimes there are things that are promoted by, you know, Eastern philosophy or other things that it seems like a really good thing. Um, uh, meditation and those kinds of things are often what's like yoga, contemplative prayer, things like that. They're entering the Christian sphere, but they didn't start with Christians. They started in a whole different other worldview. And when Christians accept those into it, the practices and those techniques, you don't know where they started, you're gonna have a you're gonna have a trouble. You're gonna have trouble with that. So how might those originators worldview affect the purpose of why something is done or what motivates it? And then of course last, you know, compare what they believe to the Bible to make sure that it does agree. We know the verse, Isaiah 20, to law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in it. There's no truth in it. So there's all kinds of things that you will experience in your life, whether it's, you know, controversy on evolution and creation or, you know, moral relativism, whether there's absolute truth or the LGBTQ issues that are out there or spiritualism in many different forms. Um, human reasoning about the Bible, um, all these different things, they will, they will be presented to you at some point or another. And you have to look at these issues through a biblical worldview. Otherwise, you will not know who's telling you the truth and who's not telling you the truth. And just like we started with that video with the BBC, the BBC was so effective in that hoax was because people trusted it. And what I want you to remember is be careful who you trust. Before you trust someone, make sure that they have a biblical worldview. And even then, you know, we're all human. We may even be prone then. Don't just trust them because they have, you know, a biblical worldview. Check to see if what they say agrees with the Bible. Because that's how you really know if they have a biblical worldview is if they're agreeing with the Bible. So I want to end with this um, verse right here. It says, John 18, 37, 38 it's so when Jesus was brought before Pilate, and this is part of Jesus' answer. Jesus says, To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said unto him, What is truth? And when he said it, he went out. It's a very sad ending, because he asked a very important question. What is truth? And I hope that each of you will ask that question, what is truth? But in this verse, it said where truth can be found. I've come to bear witness of the truth, and anyone who hears my voice, he will know the truth. So my challenge to you is don't be Pilate. Don't walk away from the truth that will make you free. Because there are many people who would like to hide the truth. But don't be Pilate.
Don't walk away from the biggest question that will help you to understand life. So let's bow our heads to pray. Father in heaven, I thank you that you are a God of love and mercy. Of You want us to come reason together. And a biblical worldview answers the questions that every human being on planet Earth asks. And it gives it in a beautiful framework so that we can understand our small place, our little small planet, in a much larger conflict. But we can understand our place. We can understand why things happen the way that they do. But I pray that you would especially be with each of these students in the classes here, in the classes that they will take in the future, the people they will meet, that you will give them a desire to search for themselves their, the truth and found in your word, that they would have a biblical worldview and to be able to discern it in others, and that you would protect them from untruth and lead them into all truth. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.